بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا Welcome back everyone to our final uh, class in this uh, book the Mukhtasar in the Madhab of Imam Shafi'i uh, We will begin where we left off which is to read the chapter of Hajj and then he has a small section on marriage and divorce and a small section on transactions, business uh, transactions, and we'll talk about why that's included. قال المصنف رحمه الله ونفعنا بعلومه في الدارين آمين The chapter of Hajj. Pilgrimage Hajj is obligatory upon every adult, sane, free Muslim who is physically and financially able to make Hajj. If someone has a permanent illness, it is permissible to send someone to make Hajj on their behalf. Now, when we talk about who Hajj is, uh, who is ob- obliged to go to Hajj, we also need to mention that this obligation is that it takes place in the time of Hajj. And the time of Hajj <coughs> is from the moment you break your fast on the last day of Ramadan, because we've left now Ramadan and entered Shawwal, and then all of Shawwal, Dhul Qa'da, and then the first uh, nine days. Of the Hijjah. So if you find yourself able with these conditions in that time, that's when it's an obligation. But if you're if you're in Muharram or Safar or uh, Jumad al-Awwal, for example, and you have these uh, conditions are met, it's not an obligation because the time for Hajj has not entered. Okay, what are the obligations for Hajj? There are five obligations during the Hajj. Number one is the Ihram with intention, to enter into the state of ihram. And the ihram is a time and place. So the the ihram can only take place in the time of hajj, as I just defined. And it must take place physically before the miqat, before those, there's like a boundary around Mecca. If you link the different locations, the miqat locations that are mentioned in the hadith, If you link them all together, it draws like this awkward looking shape around Mecca. If you are outside of that border, either north, south, east, or west, before you cross that border, you have to have entered into the state of Ahram during the time of Hajj. Now, of course, the Ahram for the man is that you take off all of your clothes and only wear uh, the two white garments non-stitched garments. Uh, and for the woman, her ihram is in her uh, hands and in her face. So the woman wears her normal clothing, but she cannot cover her face or cover uh, her hands. Number two, the second obligation is you have to stand on the Mount of Arafah. It's actually the plain of Arafah. It's not, that mountain is called uh, Jabal al-Rahmah, but Arafah is a plain. It's an area, not a mountain. Or it's a mountain and a plain. So, but the, the more correct English translation would be plains, so as not to think that you have to actually be on the mountain, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, number three is you have to do the circumambulation, the tawaf around the Kaaba after standing in Arafah seven times. Uh, number four is you have to do the sa'i between the Safa and the Marwa. And number five is the tahliq for the man is to shave the head to to exit the state of ihram and for the woman to do taqseer just to shorten her hair of course a man can do taqseer as well but the prophet sallam made dua for those who shave their heads twice and in another narration three times whereas he only made dua for those who trimmed once so those are the five major things that must be done that constitute the hajj now, what are the wajibat? So in Hajj, we have furud and then wajibat. So what are the wajibat? The, the furud or the arkan, if you don't do any of those aforementioned in the Hajj, doesn't count. The wajibat, we will come to see what the difference is when we discuss them. Number one is changing into the two white sheets that are made of unhemmed cloth at the designated location. I already described that. That's obviously for the man. Number two, is staying the night in Muzdalifa, which is the night of the slaughter, the night of the Nahr. Number three, staying three nights after the day of Eid, Tashriq at Mina. 
Number four, stoning seven stones, one at each time at the pillar of Aqaba, which is the day of the slaughter. Number five is throwing three stones on each day of the three days following the Eid, that is the 11th, 12th, and 13th of Dhul Hijjah. The timing for this starts on each day after Dhuhr prayer till sunset. And number six is the farewell tawaf, tawaf al ifada, which is the last thing that you do before you leave. Now, if you miss one of these requirements, you're going to have to pay an expiation by slaughtering an animal. That's the difference between what happens if you miss the wajib versus if you miss the uh, the fard or the um, the rukun. The rukun can't be replaced or can't be expiated for. You have to do it. As for Umrah, the minor obligation, which by the way in the Shafi'i Madhab is also a fard once in your life if you're able to. So either connected with the Hajj or as a separate act. There are four obligations. One is changing one's clothes into the ahram for the man. And for the woman, it would be entering in the state of the ahram as we described just a little while ago. Uh, the tawaf, seven times around the Kaaba. Uh, then the pacing back and forth between the safa and the marwa and then shaving or trimming uh, the head. Of course, it's haram for women to shave their head without reason. Uh, and for the woman, it's just a trimming. There's only one requirement, and that is to change the clothes uh, at the dedicated location, the miqat. So if you enter past the miqat, not having done the ahram, and then you put on your ahram, you're going to have to pay for a sacrifice. Pay a sacrifice. Obligations of the tawaf. So the tawaf is like prayer. In other words, you have to have the, the same conditions of the salah. The sa'i between Safa and Marwa is different. You don't have to have wudu, etc. <coughs> so that's why he says for the first one, you have to cover your private parts. So if your awra is not covered, your tawaf doesn't count. Number two is you have to have purification from both uh, major, uh, minor and major impurities. Number three, cleanliness of the clothes, body, and area in which the tawaf is being done. Number four is you have to keep the Kaaba on your left side, so you're walking counterclockwise, circling the Kaaba seven times, starting the tawaf, each tawaf circuit at the black stone. And all of that is very effectively marked with lights and stripe on the ground and everything now. How about the sa'i? Pacing back and forth between the safa and the moro. The first uh, obligation is you have to start with the Safa and the Safa is the closest hill to the Kaaba so it's very hard to miss it because when you finish your seven Tawaf and you end up at the Maqam of Ibrahim you just follow the, the paths and the signs are right there it's right there it's you can sometimes if it's not crowded you can actually see it and then you start with the hill of Marwa for the second walk so you go from Safa to Marwa that's one and then Marwa to Safa, that's two. And then back and forth. So the seventh one, you end up in Marwa. Uh, continue in that order for a total of seven times, of course. And walking between the two hills at a fast pace is to start after the circumambulation. Well, there's a part of the tawaf of each, of each pace, of each track, that you kind of trot. I mean, it's a, a horseback riding term, but you sort of, you have a little bit of a jog, which is a sunnah. And the first three tawaf around the Kaaba, I forgot to mention, is a sunnah to do that faster than the other ones. But now, because of the density of people, it's almost impossible to do. You just sort of, you do what you can do, but that's a sunnah. Okay, the pilgrimage has two endings. The tahlilan. Ending the hajj happens by completing three actions. Completing two of the three actions is called the first ending, at tahlil al-awwal, and then the completing of the third is called the second and final ending. The three actions are the tawaf, shaving the head, and throwing the stone at al-aqaba. So once you do that, the first ending allows one to perform all the acts that were restricted by ahram except women and marriage. In other words, <coughs> When you finish those three things and you shave your head, you take off the ahram clothes and then you put on your regular clothes if you're a man uh, and you can do everything. You can put perfume and all of that kind of stuff, except you can't contract a marriage and you can't have sexual intercourse. Ending the umrah happens once 
all of its actions are complete. Whereas in Umrah, when you finish the tawaf and the sai, khalas, the Umrah is done, and you cut your head, it's over. The whole ihram, the, there's no first and second. What are the things that are restricted when you have ihram, just so all of this can make sense to you? There are six restricted acts while in the state of ihram. Number one is men covering the head or wearing hemmed clothes. So a man can't, like you can't wear a cap like I'm wearing now, and you can't wear hemmed clothes, meaning that the, the article of clothing closes around your body through stitching. Not that there is no stitching. So if I went to Umrah or Hajj and I have no ihram, I could take off this thobe and then wrap it around me and tuck it in like a towel. Even though this has stitching, oh, it's, you can see the stitch here that closes around my sleeve. Uh, uh, so it's kullu muhit in muhit that the the ihata that the enclosure of the article of clothing around you is through stitching, and that's a, one of the common misconceptions and also one of the challenges in translation because there's it's a legal construct. As for women, they are restricted from covering their face and wearing gloves, as I mentioned before. So the ihram of the mar'a of the woman is in her face and in her hands. That means that they have to remain exposed. Number two, using perfume or anything that has use, that is used as perfume on one's body, clothes, bed, etc. So that also means you can't use soap that's scented, uh, toothpaste that's scented, I think creams that are scented. So in the, while you are in the state of ihram, you can't do that. Number three, using creams or oils in one's hair or beard. So you can't put beard oil or hair oil, etc. Number four is you cannot remove any hair or nails on purpose. So you can't clip your nails, you can't shave. Uh, but if you know, if a, if a hair falls out accidentally, or if you know, you just go like this and you're itching and then a hair falls out, that's okay, that's excused. But you can't pluck out that. If anyone uh, does one of the four actions mentioned while in the state of ihram, then they need to fix this status by one of the following. You either slaughter a, sh slaughter a sheep, feed six people, a total of three saw, which is uh, eight and a half or 8.25 kilograms of food, uh, uh, or fast for three days. You also can't have intercourse while you're in a state of ihram. If what doing, uh, done during Umrah, then the Umrah is invalid and it will, be need to, it will need to be redone. If done intentionally before the first ending of the pilgrimage, the Hajj, then it is invalid, the Hajj is invalid, and it should be redone, and a, a, a kafara, an expiation of the slaughter is applied. It's not a punishment, a kafara is not a punishment, it's an expiation. It is applied by either slaughtering a camel, which is quite expensive, several thousand dollars. If unable, then a cow, if unable, then seven sheep. if unable, then feeding a person with what is equivalent to a camel, if unable, then fasting the amount of days that equal the weight of the camel uh, divided by one mud, which is 687.5 grams. So the intercourse, uh, obviously, in a state of ahram is a big problem, and it creates a, a very uncomfortable situation because then you have to come back the next year to hajj. Uh, hunting edible wild animals and cutting down trees. Hunting is also forbidden in the area of both the haram of Mecca and Medina. If uh, one does any of the two in the state of ihram, then a fidya is needed to be done according to what we just said. Okay, that's the hajj. Conditions of business transactions and marital laws. The reason this is included in an introductory book is that you know, this is part of life and uh, inshallah, either you are married or you will get married or you're looking to get married and knowing the basic rules about that stuff is important, obviously for obvious reasons, and also transactions is important because all day we're transacting, we're buying and selling and, and interacting with people, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, those that want to get involved in business and marital interactions need to know their methods and systems according to Islamic law. The conditions of the business transaction are, so this is the basic structure of a, trans, of a business transaction as envisioned by the Sharia. So any type of transaction such as marriage because marriage is considered a transaction these are the basic rules we're going to talk about the basic things of course there are a lot of details that will be left out but this is the basic structure number one is the seller's agreement by a statement or a gesture so <clears throat> if i'm a bookseller and you walk in and this is what you see 
then I'm basically gesturing to you that all of these books, uh, you know, can be sold. But then if you find like a bookcase over here and it has a door on it with a lock, uh, obviously whatever's inside there, I'm gesturing to you that it's off limits, right? So that's what it means that there is a, a gesture. Either you say, you know, uh, all my books are for sale. I'm just going to use this as an example so you can see them. All my books are for sale. Or you just walk into the store and then they, therefore you assume that everything is for sale. Number two is the buyer's acceptance. So if I if you if you come to my shop and then you pick out a book and the book says you know twenty dollars uh, and then you you go to me like I'd like to buy this book that means that you are agreeing to buy this book at this price, right? So there has to be this agreement from the seller and then there has to be the acceptance of the terms of that from the buyer. Now this all might sound like it's common sense and it is for the large period, but when you for the large part. But when you get into the details of transaction law in Islam, you will understand why it's important to establish these rules first, because as we get into the details, differences can be seen. Number three, both are required to be adults, sane, and the deal is done by free will. Okay, so you can't coerce someone to buy or sell something, that, that transaction doesn't count. If your child comes in and you're still in the car in a phone call, you have a, a business meeting or a work meeting, and your kids walk in and they're young, your kids can't just grab a book and be like, I want to buy this. I can't accept. I have to wait for the parent to come in uh, 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 because the child, maybe the child is just, you know, fooling around. I can't assume that the child has been given instructions. But if the child is old enough uh, to, to, to articulate, you know, my father, uh, he's in the car, but he would like, he told me to come in and buy, you know, Sahih al-Bukhari. Uh, and, uh, the, the you know the, the latest edition of Sahih al Bukhari. Or if he says something like that, then, I mean, obviously those, that's not the language of a kid. Obviously, his father told him that would be okay. Okay, number four: the item being sold or bought needs to be clean or can be washed off from any filth. So, uh, books collect dust. Uh, it's very common anywhere you are. So, usually in in Arab countries, or like in Egypt, where there's a lot of dust, it, usually there'll be a rag or a duster nearby or on each shelf so that you can like dust the book so you can see the quality of it. And I'm just using this as an example. It could be anything else. But the item needs to be complete. Uh, sorry, it needs to be clean and and uh, there needs to be no obscurity to it. You need to be able to to know exactly what you're buying. Number five is that the item needs to be useful. Okay, so I can't sell a jar of air uh, or I can't just sell like some rocks that I picked up from my garden or, you know, something just is useless. It has to be, has, it has to have use. There has to be a use for it. Menfao. Number six, it has to be delivered. The ability to be delivered. So if I, uh, books again, you see this book back here. This is one book that has 14, 14, 14 volumes. So if you go into a bookstore, Usually they won't have all 14 volumes on display. They'll just have one. Why? Because it takes up too much space. So I, this happens to be a commentary or this happens to be a critical edition of the Futahat al makaya of Ibn Arabi. So let's say you, you're in my bookstore. I only have volume one on the bookshelf and you pick it up. You're like, oh, I've been looking for this uh, edition of the Futahat. Uh, is, it, is it a complete set? I said it's a complete set. Uh, the other 13 uh, volumes are in the warehouse or are in another room or something like that. So I have to be able to deliver them to you and show them to you or, or we agree on how you're going to receive them. Um, number seven, the item to be sold is owed. Not owed, owned. That's a mistake. The item to be sold is owned by the seller or has authorization to sell it. So if you walk into my bookshop, all of these have to be mine. Uh, they can't be books that belong to somebody else unless somebody else gave me their books or their library to sell on their behalf, and I'm just going to take a commission from it. That's permissible. That's a form of wakala that I've been deputized by them to, to do it. So And, and I'm giving the book example. Uh, well, one, because there are all these books behind me, so it's easy to, to make it clear. But... This is something that uh, these scenarios that I'm giving you are real. So it's very possible that you go to a bookstore and you're like, oh, I love this one book. It's an old book. It's a rare book. 
and you're like, um, how much is it? And the man, you know, I'll say it's a thousand dollars. You're like, oh, that's that's steep. Can you come down? So say, well, lie, it's not mine. It belongs to somebody else, and this is the price that he gave me, and I have no room to negotiate. That's very common. So he's honest, and he has the right to sell it. He's been deputized to sell it, uh, and it's not his. And it's either sort of like a take it or leave it situation, or I just own it outright, and then we can negotiate. Okay. Number eight, all details of the item involved in the transaction must be clearly known by both parties. Example, uh, that is its size, shape, and description, etc. So uh, let's go back <coughs> to this 14 volume set here. So I have one book on the shelf and the other 13 are in another room uh, and you want to buy it. Uh, let's say that one of the volumes is slightly damaged. I would have to mention that to you. Or let's say one of the volumes is missing. I would have to mention that to you. Or let's say one of the volumes is not from this set, but another set or another type of paper, or it was Xerox copy and I bound it to complete the set. I downloaded the PDF, for example, from the internet and I went to a local printer and I, I had to sort of do a hack job to complete it. Again, these are all actual scenarios that I've been involved in before buying, buying books. So you just have to describe the thing in its entirety. And the person that when you buy it and you go home to open up the box or the bag, you're, there's no surprises. You have to know exactly what it is you're buying. That's what the, the idea is behind it. Number nine, uh, business terminology cannot be vague and unclear. For example, I'll sell you everything in this box without seeing what's in it, or I'll sell you whatever you can carry are not allowed uh, in Islam. So it has to be definitive. Now, of course, we don't buy and sell speaking this way, but we're going to do it in the class so we understand. So I would like to buy this edited uh, critical edition of Imam Ibn al-Arabi's Futahat al makkiyah which consists of 14 volumes that's printed in what I can't remember when it was printed in the 50s or something like that. Uh, and it has this kind of binding in it, et cetera. Okay, I agree to buy from you the aforementioned book. Now, we don't have to say that because there is a common orf, there's a common custom of, as we said earlier, that uh, uh, when you buy a book, you just buy the book. All of that is assumed. So, but what you can't do is you can't come up with vague and weird and nebulous statements like some of the examples uh, that, he, that, he, that he's given. And then lastly, one cannot purchase the unseen, nor can the unseen be sold. So it has to be something that is um, either seen or it's described with accuracy, which is called al-salam, which is a type of business transaction. That's how it's described in the sharia, something that is intrinsically described. So when you go... Um, to like uh, to buy a computer or a, or a or a let's say like a laptop, and you go to the store. If you go to like the Apple Store, for example, uh, the, the Apple Store will have their products on display. So, like I, I teach the class with this iPad. So you have like an iPad on display. You play with it. You I like this a lot. I'd like to buy this. When you say I like to buy this, you're not buying this one. This is just a display, but you are buying one that has the same exact description that they're going to go get from the storeroom or they're out of the inventory. So you buy it and it's going to be sent to your house. That would be permissible because it's been described. It's not unseen. You've seen a prototype. You've seen a, a type of it. It's been described, you know, it's size, you know, it's weight, you know, it's color, so on and so forth. Okay. So these 10 things are just a basic understanding of how transactions are done and how we can buy and sell. Now, one derivative of this is to understand the riba because it's an enormous sin so the next section is on riba which should be translated as usury not as interest because interest is something else if one were to buy food with some type of food or silver with silver or gold with gold so these are the categories in which there is riba food for food fruit for fruit gold for gold silver for silver then the transaction must be done immediately you must release the funds before departure and the weights and the sizes need to be equivalent. Otherwise, it would be considered riba. So if I have five gold coins 
and I'm buying your gold coins, they have to be the same five gold coins and they have to have the same weight and, and, and things like that. And that has to be done in the majlis of the of al-bayah, in the transaction uh, gathering that has to take place. So when you buy or exchange like for like, it has to be the equal amount. If it's not, then it becomes a ribawi transaction, which is haram. However, if food was bought with another type of food or buy gold using silver then, so I have gold coins and I'm going to buy your silver coins or vice versa, then the transaction has to be done immediately and the release of funds before the departure and no equivalency is needed. Why? Because there are different types. So there's no equivalency needed, but the transaction has to happen right away. Oh, I said marriage and divorce. There is, there is no section on marriage in the book, it seems. But it's covered by the basic transaction, which is that there is an offer and accepting the offer of marriage in that case. Okay, and then lastly, uh, optional business transaction by free will, al-khiyar, because there's no co coercion, as we said, in the transaction. While purchasing or agreeing to a certain deal, one has the option to wait a few days, meaning three exactly, either for testing or deciding about whether or not they will purchase the item. Three days are the maximum allowed number of days for testing or deciding on an item to purchase. However, the duration of testing ends by buying the item and departing with it with an agreement. If there is any damage, found after the departure, one has the right to return it immediately. So you can, I'm gonna you know, sell you this phone. You can take it and sit on it for three days. And then you can come back and say, thank you, but I'm not interested. So that's permissible. Or if I sell you the item and I was honest, you know, I mean, I, I did everything that I can to be honest, but you went home and you opened the box and there was a damage. I mean, you know, Stuff happens. It's, it's it's okay. Or like in my book example, you look, you open volume five, and then every five pages is a blank page. I have many books in my library, unfortunately, that are like that. I, after I buy them and I travel with them and I come to use them, there'll be many blank pages. So in in the case of a book, that's considered a defect. So if within the three days, I have the right to go return the book. After that, sort of the the sale becomes final. The following actions are forbid, forbidden in business transactions. Selling a returned item before receiving it. So I'm going to give you back the phone. I got to get the phone from you first before I sell it to person B. Taking from the city and selling in the wilderness. Maybe that's in reference to needed resources. Let me just see the Arabic really quickly. Uh, if you, uh, I'm sorry, if you can just pause for one second, I have somebody at the door. This is, I have to sign for this and I've been waiting for this package. I really apologize. Just one second. My apologies. The following actions are forbidden. Yeah. So taking from the city and selling into the wilderness, these are things that are, are needed by people in the city. Uh, number three, going out of town to sell or buy an item from people that don't know the market price because <laughs> you're scamming them <laughs> uh, to bargain after a Muslim brother or city, uh, sister already have a deal. So let's say I'm in the bookstore and you're buying this book 
and uh, you, I see that you've negotiated with the book owner, the oh, the, the the shop owner, a uh, hundred dollars. So I really want it. So after the, uh, so the guy is like, okay, I'm going to go to the ATM machine, uh, and I'm going to go withdraw money. I'll, I'll be right back. So you leave, and then I come up to the owner. I was like, by the, I'll give you 150 bucks for the book. That's haram. Just like if I know that a man has proposed to a woman, it would be haram for me to circumvent that and propose. So you'll find a hadith about that. Why do we mention them in the, in the same area? Because it's a transaction. It's the same type of uh, decorum and rules apply across both marriage and div- in marriage situations and in transactions. So whenever I do a nikah, I always say, especially when there's a lot of non-Muslims present, I always mention that you know marriage in Islam follows transaction law. And, and I mean, it sounds very strange, I think, to people, but that's why, because when you actually do the kitab, it's, it's like, you know, she offers, she's proposing marriage to him, and then he's <laughs> agreeing with these conditions. So for non-Muslims, it must seem like very like, weird, like what's going on? They think of marriage as something different. But for us, it's a transaction. You're offering something with conditions and you're accepting it. Okay, and then selling what others have already purchased. Right? There is a famous hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ was coming back from a battle and he bought some livestock from a Bedouin trader uh, and he agreed on the price. Uh, and, uh, and then he said, like, okay, I'll, I'll, when I get to the city, I'll take them from you. So the Prophet ﷺ went ahead to Medina. And then when he went into Medina, the Bedouin sold it to somebody else. Right? So there was this, this dispute when the Prophet ﷺ, uh, came back uh, to, to Medina and one of the companions came and bore witness that the Prophet ﷺ bought this. So you can't do that. You can't, you can't sell the same item twice. Uh, uh, you can't, next, you cannot manipulate the price of goods. So to artificially inflate prices so that people can get it, uh, uh, or I'm going to, uh, I need a certain type of ingredient to make my product. So I'm going to buy all of the ingredient. So therefore it becomes, I can charge more, you know, something like that. And then you cannot separate between a slave woman and her son. Uh, obviously we don't have slavery anymore. Thankfully, Alhamdulillah and the Sharia uh, encourages the freeing of slaves. But when slavery was an issue, obviously many of the rules of slavery took place in the section of transaction law because you're buying and selling people as, as hideous as that sounds to us. But one of the, th- the things is that you, can, you cannot separate a mother from their child. As a matter of fact, you can't separate a mother from their child at all, slave or no slave. But the reason it's included here is because the slave would be purchased. And I, you know, I know that that sounds offensive, but this is part of our legal history and tradition. And we have those rules that we can benefit where we can benefit from them. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa a'lam wa sallallahum ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. So this uh, ends, thus ends our uh, reading of this book and uh, this little series that we started a few days ago, reading Al-Mukhtasar al-Saghir. Uh, in the, as an introductory book to the Shafi Madhab. Inshallah, uh, I will be traveling uh, shortly for a few weeks. So we will resume, inshallah, on Sunday, February 19th, because we have more books in the series to teach, uh, to go over. Yeah, Sunday, February 19th. Uh, the next book, inshallah, will be the Maqasid of Imam al Nawawi, uh, which is a, uh, will be a little bit more advanced than this, and then so on and so forth. So, other than the scheduling issues, is there anything that you guys would like to ask me uh, before we end, whether it's related to this book, the previous or the previous books? Please use this as an opportunity. I'll get my chat thing going. And I'm all ears. No questions. Alhamdulillah, everything is straightforward. Okay. Then we will resume, inshallah, <clears throat> as I said, uh, Sunday, February the 19th. Uh, please be on the lookout for an email from the administrators so that everyone is on the same page. 
Uh, and I believe for the remaining books, I think I have a PDF or, or yeah, I think I have a PDF of all of them that I can share so people can have them, inshallah. So if there are no questions, inshallah, I pray that Allah Ta'ala keeps you safe. And um, I look forward to our next meeting, inshallah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.